2 Chronicles chapter number 35, I want to begin tonight in verse uh, number 20, and this is what the scripture says. After all of this, speaking of the great Passover celebration, after all of this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Necho, king of Egypt, went up to fight at Carchemis on the Euphrates, and Josiah went out to meet him. But he sent envoys to him, saying, What have we to do with each other, king of Judah? I am not coming against you this day, but against the house with which I am at war. And God has commanded me to hurry. Cease opposing God who is with me, lest he destroy you. Nevertheless, Josiah did not turn away from him, but he disguised himself in order to fight with him. He did not listen to the words of King Necho from the mouth of God, but came to fight in the plain of Megiddo. And the archers shot King Josiah. And the king said to his servants, Take me away, for I am badly wounded. So his servants took him out of the chariot and carried him in his second chariot and brought him to Jerusalem. And he died. And he was buried in the tombs of his fathers. All Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. Jeremiah also uttered a lament for Josiah. And all the singing men and singing women have spoken of Josiah and their laments to this day. They made these a rule in Israel. Behold, they are written in the laments. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah and his good deeds, according to what is written in the law of the Lord, and his acts first and last, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. There's very few people in the Old Testament that nothing negative is said about. The, one of the things that I love about the Bible is when Scripture reveals the lives of the people who are printed on the pages of Scripture, the Bible doesn't go out of its way to cover up their faults. As a matter of fact, the Bible reveals some pretty horrific things that are done by people that loved the Lord but gave into their flesh. As a matter of fact, the next series we're going to do starting in a couple of Wednesdays is on the life of Samson. And he's in the Hebrews Hall of Faith, but Samson's life is a train wreck. And yet in the midst of all of his fleshly impulses and his poor decisions, Samson somehow managed to end in faith towards God and he is memorialized in Hebrews chapter 11 as one of the pillars of faith. Now, as we've studied Josiah's life together, we've seen this as a man after God. This is a man who started as a boy on the throne and for 18 years from age 8 to 26 was doing the best that he could do to lead the nation of Israel back to God. And then when he discovered the Bible at the age of 26, the Word of God got a hold of his heart and he realized that Israel stood condemned and guilty before a holy God. And so he immediately started calling the nation to deep, deep repentance. If you'll remember with me, he cleansed the land of all of the pagan idolatry. He got rid of, and we'll see even some of this tonight, he got rid of all of the, the wicked priests of the false gods. He rid the land of these two horrific gods of Molech and Chemosh, false gods that people were sacrificing their children to. And all throughout his testimony from age really 26 to his death in this chapter at age 39, all he did was go after God so he could honor God according to the word of God that had been discovered during his lifetime. And so when I look at him, I think, man, this guy motivates me. This guy, I want to be like Josiah. I want to live wholeheartedly. I don't want to live in the status quo. I don't want to live for Jesus with the lukewarmness that characterizes so much of the church today. But even a guy like Josiah proves that he's human. At the end of his life, this godly man made a regrettable decision that ultimately caused his death at age 39. Why do I tell you that? I'm going to give you this before I even get into the scriptures. There's only one king of Israel that never sinned. There's only one human that never sinned. As much as we long for heroes and people to motivate us and inspire us and people that we can emulate in their walk with God, let's always remember this. There was only one Savior, one perfect, one sinless Son of God. Everybody else is a sinner saved by grace, and once we're saved by grace, we are set free into the status of being saints of God, children of God. 
Like right now, we, when we think of saints, we think of, you know, like stained glass windows or marble sculptures, and we think of the certain with St. Paul, St. John, St. Peter. Well, right here, I got St. Gabe. Over here, I got St. Art. We got there over, over in this direction, we got saints peppering the, 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 the seats in the sanctuary. Every one of us that are saved by the grace of God through the blood of Jesus, you're a saint. And so when we look at the the people in Scripture, we tend to exalt them up to a level that God never intended them to be exalted. And although he led a great life, Josiah's final chapter leaves us saying almost, oh man, you know, so close to running his race without a flaw. But in the end, it just proves what we already know. So in 2 Kings 23 and verse 24, here's what we read. Moreover, Josiah put away the mediums and the necromancers, and the household gods, and the idols, and all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and Jerusalem, that he might establish the words of the law that were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. So, what I've done here is I read the parallel passage as I opened up, but I'm preaching the other passage which reveals the same thing. So, I think we'll be able to do this. So, when we're looking at this, my first point is after the celebration, the fight continues. And it says simply that Josiah did some things. He kept on advancing this great work of reformation that he had begun. Now, why is this important? Well, when we're thinking through this, a lot of the times when, when Christians experience a great breakthrough, a great victory, the completion of an amazing project for the Lord, just like Josiah had done, sometimes believers tend to get a little slack. We get in neutral. A lot of people can handle pressure and adversity and defeat, but rare is the believer that can handle blessing after blessing after blessing. And so Josiah shows us what to do when God gives us breakthrough. We don't slacken. We don't draw back. We don't spend weeks and weeks and weeks celebrating what just happened. We keep pressing on to the call of God in our lives. And so what did he do? The scriptures tell us here that after the Passover, Josiah went right back to doing what he had been doing, and that is continuing to rid the land of all of the sinful practices. And here you have this statement in 2 Kings 23, 24, that he put away the mediums and the necromancers. Did anybody wake up today and use the word necromancer in their, in their normal conversation? None of us did. So it warrants a little explanation. Who are these mediums and these necromancers? Well, let me tell you what they are. They were spiritists of Josiah's day. They were what we might call witches in our day or wizards in our day. They trafficked in the dark arts. And so, in particular, these two words in the Hebrew recognize that these people inter interacted intentionally with the dead. They conjured up dead spirits. They activated demonic activity in their lives without even knowing it by trying to work for a living as a, a spiritist that would help people contact the dead. And so when Josiah wanted to continue all of the work that he had begun, he moved into this territory. And he said to these people, not only would they no longer be practicing, but the Bible is very kind in the ESV. I preach out of the English Standard Version. When it says he put away the mediums and the necro necromancers, let me tell you what that actually means. He burned them with fire. He executed them. You say, Jeff, that's horrific. How could he do that? Because the law of God prescribed that, that in Israel, if there were ever spiritists that conjured up the dead or they played around with witchcraft or wizardry, that the penalty for that because it was such a severe cancer in the uh, nation of Israel, the penalty was execution. And so Josiah enacted civil execution on these spiritists, and they were, they were put to death via fire. Now, that's pretty intense. Why, why is that in our Bible? Well, it's not to empower you and I to execute people that live ungodly. We know that that is wrong. But it is to reveal the absolute holiness of God and the, intense, the intensity of his commitment to holiness among his people. And so when Josiah had been doing all of these re reformations in Israel, it came down to it that he actually had to execute the people that were continuing to lead Israel astray. you got to realize this. After all of the reformation that Josiah had been enacting, and it had gone on for several years up to this point, there were still people on the land that were thumbing their nose at Yahweh. 
There were still people that were just literally hell-bent on continuing to practice evil and witchcraft. And so Josiah, after the celebration, said, guys, the party is over. It's time to get back to work. I want us to go throughout all of the land. It even goes further. He talks about, the, the scriptures talk about moving into the people that had household gods. That the practice in ancient Israel, the idolatrous practice and the, the culture was so filled with the worship of pagan gods that people in their homes would have little carvings and little statues and little, little trinkets that they would use and they would pray to these things and worship around these things. And so Josiah was not content just to rid the landscape of paganism. He brought down the judgment of God and, and somehow got into homes where it was rumored that people would have uh, trinkets and talismans and, and different kind of uh, uh, idols in their home. And he rid the people from their homes, literally got, got all of that junk out of the homes. That is how serious the Lord is. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because I want you to know there's a tendency in the human heart to kind of bypass the little things that we consider aren't that big of a deal. We, we have the potential to tolerate sinful practices in our life, and the reason why we give ourselves permission potentially to tolerate those things is because we look at all the worst things going on in the land, and we're saying, oh, I can see how God would want to take care of that, but what's this little thing in my life? What's this little thing in my home? What's this little thing in my heart? And yet the spotlight of God gets so precise in this uh, season in Israel that literally God wasn't willing to rid the nation of sin without ridding each individual home of sin. It's just a reminder to us that we can't hide in church. We can't hide behind somebody else's walk with Jesus. We can't, you know, uh, um, what do they call it when you come behind somebody and you catch their wind? What is that called? Like on a bike? Drafting, thank you, yeah. And so we can't draft behind somebody else's commitment with Jesus that the Lord ultimately looks at us. And as our kids get older, we've got to remind them, hey, look, you can't ride on mom and dad's coattails. You, you, you can't, my profession of faith doesn't work for you. My commitment to Jesus doesn't work for you. And so ultimately, God comes as a, as a um, uh, just an inspector of our hearts. And he doesn't come to condemn us or to judge us, or to accuse us in the sense of, you know, there's no possibility of hope, but he comes in there as the one who has the rights to our home, the rights to our house. He doesn't have to ask permission, the rights to our heart, and he says, we've got some cleaning to do. And so that's why want, that is in the scripture by way of application. It's important that we recognize that. So go down into verse number 25, and yes, we are still in 2 Kings, 2 Kings 23, 25. Here's the next thing that we learn uh, from Josiah's final chapter. After our story ends, our testimony remains. The Bible says of Josiah, listen to this, before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might according to the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. You know what my, my mind does when I read that? I, I kind of want to say, <clears throat> what about David? L Lord, I thought David was the man. I thought David was the king, but we've got to actually parse out this verse. It's very specific. The Bible is saying here, in the context of any, any of the kings, nobody, nobody above and beyond Josiah before or after pursued the Lord according to the law of Moses, with the same degree of heart, soul, and might. So whereas David might have been peerless as a worshiper, peerless as a, a glorious king in Israel, the Bible says here that when it came to somebody being convicted in their heart concerning the law of God, the word of God, and being loyal and being zealous and burning with a, a, a holy fury against sin, nobody could stand next to Josiah and be compared more greatly. That's an awesome thing to think about, especially in our day where, you know, Bible faithfulness is, oh, that's old school, or that's legalistic. Doctrinal purity, oh man, come on, it's not about doctrine, it's not about theology, it's just about mm, experience. And, and we live in a day where literally, I, I just see this trend, I mean, listen, we need to be like... Uh, the sons of Issachar who, who looked around and they discerned the times 
And they knew what Israel needed to do. We need a modern day movement of the sons of Issachar where people look at, at, at the United States of America and the church and they can discern what needs to happen. And one of the things that I see has happened just since I've been saved, since 1994, is there has this been this migration away from the Word of God, this migration of diminishing truth, this migra migration towards um, an easier ability to redefine truth. The, the, and the, the results of that is sin is no longer sin, holiness is no longer expected, uh, absolute truths are what is that? And we, we, we mimic Pilate. Pilate said, what is truth? And friends, I'm, I'm saying that when Josiah was getting laid to rest, that the Holy Spirit moved on the writer of 2 Kings to say essentially this, put this down about Josiah. There was nobody, no king in Israel that had more zeal to honor the word of God than Josiah. That's not a bad way to have a eulogy. It's not a bad thing to have written on your tombstone that you were faithful to God by being faithful to the word of God. I, I think it's probably a good time to say this. Most of you already know this. You wouldn't be here if you probably didn't agree with this. But um, we're a church that is founded on the authority of the Word of God and the necessity of the Holy Spirit. So the Word of God has a very central place here at Newbridge Church and all across the mission base that we are going to continue to be teachers and preachers of the Word of God. And we're not just going to teach it and preach it. We're going to live it. We're going to obey it. We're going to share it. Why? Because you cannot live a life that honors the Lord and brings Him glory to, if you are negligent concerning the Scriptures. And so we want to continue to do that. And at the end of our lives, I wouldn't mind if somebody said about me, he was faithful to God because he believed the Word of God. If that's, if that's all that's said about me, I'm going to heaven happy, amen? Because I don't want to get lost in the soup of the 21st century American church where the Bible is just kind of like a, a decoration for everything else that's going on. So Josiah has this testimony about him that none arose after him, nor none went before him, that went after it with all of the soul and all of the heart and all of the might. Don't miss that last part. Going after God, loving God, being honorable unto God with all of your might, it just means your back's in it the whole time. It's not a theory. It's not just in the mind. It's not just in the heart. It's not sentiment in the heart or just theology in the mind, but it has hit you so hard, your response is, I've got to go after him. I've got to glorify him, and I've got to do it with all my might. So it removes the option of being a casual Christian when we apply this to our lives. And so, yes, I've said it so many times here recently, but I do believe that this is a generation that God wants to radicalize for the gospel. That, that literally, that the, the Bible Belt version of syrupy Christianity is on its deathbed, and God's going to put a DNR on it. You know what that is? Do not resuscitate. That he does not want the old syrupy, tra tra I don't mean traditions, all traditions are bad, but in the context of mindless Bible Belt churchianity, God says, I'm laying it on the table, it's dead, it's dying, it's gasping, don't resuscitate it. Why? Because God is calling a generation of Christians, and you're in this generation. You may not be the youngest in it, but you're in it, and he's calling us to go after him with all of our might. To go at, why? Because he's worthy. He's gloriously worthy. And so that might involves our energy, it involves our resources, it involves, yes, our passions and our desires. And will there be sacrifice? Yes, there'll be sacrifice. Beware of the hyper-grace movement that just says, oh, God covered it all. Just put your feet up and wait for Jesus to return. Now, brothers and sisters, we have a mission in this life. And that is to make the name of Jesus famous and more famous in every generation. And this is our generation. And we're going to do it by the power of the Holy Spirit, the green light, and the guardrails of the Word of God that keep us from going off in the ditches. By the way, Josiah was the last godly king in Israel until the king of kings came. There wasn't another, just amazing that until Jesus Christ came to earth in all of the spanning years between Josiah and Jesus, not a single godly king ruled over Israel. As a matter of fact, 23 years after Josiah was killed, Israel was destroyed. Jer Jerusalem was destroyed by the enemy. And it wasn't until Jesus Christ came that Israel had an opportunity to see the King, the Redeemer, 
the one that the Lord had promised. So go a little further with me, still in 2 Kings 23. After the passing of years, God's word proved true. The Bible says that the Lord did not turn from the burning of his great wrath by which his anger was kindled against Judah because of all the provocations with which Manasseh, that's the grandfather of Josiah, had provoked him. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight as I have removed Israel, and I will cast off this city that I have chosen, Jerusalem, and the house of which I said my name shall be there. Now, we do have to get a little historical here. Do you remember what happened when Josiah was first presented with the word of God? He tore his royal robes. He repented. He was aghast at the reality that they had been sinning against God in their ignorance for 57 years. And Josiah repented before the Lord. And so then they he sent his entourage to go down to Huldah, the prophetess. She was the prophetess in Israel. It still strikes me that he didn't send them to Jeremiah. He didn't send them to Zephaniah, that they chose the woman, the prophetess, Huldah. And Huldah got the word of the Lord, and Huldah said that destruction was going to come upon Judah because they had killed their children, they had worshipped other gods, and they had altogether abandoned the God of Israel. And so Huldah gave that very difficult word. Not every prophetic word, friends, is going to be a pat you on the head, scratch your back, make you feel good prophetic word. Sometimes God reserves the right to just say, oh, you're in trouble. And that's what he had said to Israel. But she also gave this. She said, but, but go and tell the king that God has seen his tender heart. God has seen his tears. God has heard his cry and witnessed his repentance. And so the king will die in his peace before the trouble hits Israel. And so that prophetic word was given, but so many years had gone by since then. So many years had transpired, and there's a temptation when, the, when a prophetic word doesn't come to pass immediately, people think, well, we must have missed it. M maybe it was wrong. Maybe that was me. Maybe that was just them getting it wrong. Maybe I interpreted it wrong. And sometimes when a prophetic word is delayed in its fulfillment, people have a tendency to forget about it, but when God gives a prophetic word through somebody, he never forgets about it. And so he's, he's never in a hurry. How many of you know that? He is never in a hurry. I'm sensing it like right now, some of you are saying, I know he ain't in a hurry, man. I've been, I've been waiting on some stuff to happen. He's just never in a hurry. And so here we are with Josiah at this point, and he's getting ready to go to his grave. He's getting ready to die, and the judgment hasn't come yet. But here we have in 2 Kings 23, that even though all of these years had passed, God still remembered what he had said. And that's what we just read. The Lord did not turn from the burning of his great wrath. It's amazing that Israel had crossed a line as a nation that God said, yeah, you can try to sweep up the mess, and I'm glad some of you have repented, but as a nation, because of what Manasseh led the nation into, um, I'm going to bring judgment on you guys. Israel was still struggling with what's called polytheism. It's just a $3 word that means they worshiped more than one God. And, and so they weren't broken of that yet. And so God had promised them, I'm going to send judgment and I'm going to carry you off. That's what Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah is all about. Jeremiah was ministering at the same time and God spoke through Jeremiah and said, Jeremiah, I want you to go tell everybody that the time is now here. Ju Jerusalem is about to fall and nobody believed Jeremiah. So it doesn't matter if, if you believe it or I believe it or if nobody believes it, but when God speaks something, he will be true to himself. And so in this unpleasant word, we're reminded here that God said he was going to do to the southern kingdom of Israel, Judah, the same thing he did to the northern kingdom. He was going to bring judgment. About 23 years after Josiah's death, the Babylonians came in. They besieged the city of Jerusalem. They ultimately destroyed the city of Jerusalem. Many, if not most, were killed. Some, like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that was that same time, they were carted off to Babylon. Most of the people were killed mercilessly by the Babylonians. Some people were left to kind of keep the land populated. But Judah, Israel, when they were finally restored to the land 70 years later, guess what they didn't do anymore? 
they didn't worship any other god but God. Isn't it interesting, and I'll just make this application before moving on to ha more happy material here, but it's interesting that when, when we go through chastisement, and it doesn't get a lot of press anymore. People don't like to talk about chastisement because they don't like to talk about the discipline of the Lord, the severity of the Lord, the holiness of the Lord, because the trend in our day is just tell, tell everybody God's happy with everything. That the Lord loves everything, and he chuckles at our little rebellion, and he, he, he snickers at the things that we do that are unholy and depraved. And, 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 you know, that's just such a misrepresentation of the heart of God. For him to be a God who chastises or disciplines his children doesn't make him a bad father. It makes him a good father. And, and the Bible says, the New Testament tells us that he chastises every son that he loves, and so the fact that we're disciplined by our Heavenly Father when we enter into wrongness, when we thumb our nose at His grace, when we refuse to repent, and God says, okay, you haven't allowed me to rule, so I'm about to overrule. And so when that happens, He's not being a bad father, He's being a good father. Because He wants us to be a reflection of His heart, and we can't do that in st seasons and states of rebellion. And so when Israel was brought back from their, their, their time out, their 70-year time out in Babylon, uh, they had learned a, a lesson as a people. They had learned that there is only one God, and He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we will worship Him and Him alone. Some of you may be in a season where you're looking back at a former season, and you're, you're, you've got regret. For whatever reason, you may have lived beneath the call of God, the will of God, the revelation of God on your life, and you had to go into that season of reaping what you sowed. Please don't mistake His discipline for His dismissal. The reason why he's disciplining you is because he does love you and he wants to keep you. And he's not going to leave you in a state of, of, of ongoing discipline. He only disciplines up to the point where you are broken, repentant, and then he begins to restore you. And what's amazing is you'd be surprised that when that brokenness and that repentance comes from us, that he delights to bring restoration to our lives. We learn some things, we may even lose some things, but you have a future ahead of you that encompasses the glorious plans that he has for you. So what am I telling you? I'm just saying, listen, Israel got disciplined, but Israel also got back in the land and they began to rebuild again. So please don't mistake the sometimes heavy hand of God as being given to you in wrath and, and just hatred and dismissal. It's simply discipline He's remembering the prayer that you prayed in bolder moments where you said, Lord, make me like your son, Jesus. And when we pray that, we sometimes forget those prayers, but sometimes the way he answers it is by saying, okay, I'm going to discipline you, but I want you to know I love you through every day of the discipline, and I'm bringing you to restoration. So let's get down to the, the last few verses. You may get out of here early tonight. After all of his glory, Josiah proved himself human. How did he do that? This is the day of his death. First of all, he engaged in a fight that was not God's will. Literally, he entered a fight that was not God's will. After all of this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, that means all the temple restoration got completed, Necho, or Necho, king of Egypt, went up to fight at Karshemesh as on the Euphrates, and Josiah went out to meet him. But the, the king of Egypt sent envoys to Josiah saying, what if we have to do with each other, king of Judah? I am not coming out against you this day, but against the house with which I am at war. Now watch what the king of Egypt does. He's a pagan. And he says to Josiah, and God has commanded me to hurry. Cease opposing God who is with me, lest he destroy you. Now, this is interesting to me. All right, so here's the scenario. Josiah has taken care of business in the land of Israel. He's, he's starting to enjoy some good years. This is 13 years after that Passover. So 13 years of resting in the goodness of God where there's holiness and peace and calmness in the land. And yet this king uh, in Egypt starts migrating, cutting through Josiah's territory. And Josiah doesn't like the looks of that at all. So Josiah, who's never been afraid of a fight, 
says, we're about to do some battle, and he sends his military representatives down there to meet uh, the king of Egypt's army who's cutting through his yard. And he says to him, why are you cutting through my yard? You cannot cut through my yard. You get out of our land. And the king of Egypt simply sends a very reasonable statement to Josiah. He's like, my beef's not with you. That's how I interpret it. My beef is not with you, Jojo. You need to go back home to your castle. I've got some business up there with the Assyrians that I am going to take care of. You just go back home. And Josiah wasn't hearing it. And so the king recognizes that Josiah is not listening to him. And he, he, he actually invokes the name of the God of Israel against Josiah. He says, Josiah, your God told me to hurry up and get there. That's why I'm cutting through your yard. I'm going the easiest and quickest route. I've got permission from your God. If you'll just go check with him, you'll find out I am not playing with you. And Josiah didn't want to have anything to do with it. And so the king of Egypt turns it up a notch. He says to him, listen, God's with me. You mess with me and God's going to be against you. Now, how does that square with your theology? Come on, think about this. Friends, it's amazing because the king of Egypt was not a believer. Um, he was a polytheist, which means the God of Israel was just in the array of all the other gods of Egypt that he worshipped. But somehow the God of Israel communicated to the king of Egypt to hurry up and go to war and you can cut through my people's land. And Josiah could not fathom that his God would communicate with a pagan king, much less give him permission to cut through their territory. This got me thinking this week. Because our theology doesn't really allow a whole lot of margin, a whole lot of latitude for us considering that God's plans sometime incorporate him using ungodly people to accomplish his will. I'm going to go there. Because every four years, no matter who wins, there's a group of Christians saying, I can't believe that ungodly man's in the White House. I just can't. It doesn't matter what year it is. There's always a group of Christians that after the election day results are brought in, they get in the presence of the Lord and they say, I love you. I know you're wiser than me, but why'd you let him in there? He's going to wreck everything. He doesn't know you. He doesn't believe in you. He lives like a reprobate. He talks like a fool. Why did you do that? Here's your biblical example. That God, when he wants to accomplish his, purp his purpose, doesn't mind getting somebody that's not even a part of his kingdom to do his dirty work for him. So we need to be, and by the way, if you don't like that explanation, there's a, very more, there's a more succinct uh, uh, teaching in the New Testament that says the powers that be are ordained by God. And we're actually called to submit unto them. We're called to actually honor them. Um, when you don't like a president or a leader, you can honor them by your silence. If you don't have anything good to say, what would your mama tell you? Don't say anything at all. And sometimes we are just called to honor God. We've learned in the kingdom that God is pleased when his children will snap off a salute at the rank, even though they don't like the man wearing that rank. And you know that if any of you are military people, which many of you are, you know that you had people that outrank you. And when they walked by, you would stand up and you'd snap off a salute, even if you didn't like the person. Why? Because you saw the stripes that he or she was wearing. And so we have to do that sometimes. And Josiah did not want to snap off a salute to the king of Egypt. And the king of Egypt, I can just see him. He's shaking his head. He said, man, you're about to get in trouble with your God. You are in for it. So go down into verse number 22 with me. There was a restraint that was not Josiah's choice. He did not restrain himself. Verse 22, nevertheless, Josiah did not turn away from the king of Egypt, but he disguised himself in order to fight with him. He did not listen to the words of Necho from the mouth of God. That tells you right there that it really was God speaking through the king of Egypt. But he came to fight him in the plain of Megiddo. I, I, I did wrestle through this, and you don't have to believe what I'm about to say because I can't prove it, but this is what I believe. I believe Josiah had entered into a time where he had nothing to fight. He had been fighting. A re Reformation work is some of the hardest work to do in the kingdom because you're not only seeking to establish what needs to be, but before you get to do that, you have to tear down what is and what was. And that requires a pugnacious spirit, 
where you are willing to fight. You, you got grace, but you also got gristle on you. You got some backbone on you. And Josiah had been fighting for years and years and years. And finally, when all of the fight within Israel was done, he didn't have a fight anymore. And so when some pagan starts cutting through his property, the fight awakens in him. Because this guy's born for war. And he didn't listen to the Lord. He entered into a fight that God did not call him to. Real quick pastoral application there. There are some things that you're going to see that are wrong. There are some, listen, if you're discerning, you're going to see a lot of things that are wrong in your world. There are things that even in the church, not only a local church, but in the church at large, that, that need to be addressed, that need to be remedied, that need to be rectified, that need to be reformed. You're, discerning people are going to see that all the time. Let me tell you what we have to do. This is what we have to do. We have to make sure we have permission to engage in a battle before we go charging off to battle. Just because we're a fighter, just because we see something wrong, does not mean that God has assigned that jurisdiction for us. Y'all follow me on this? Just because there's a, a, a battle that somebody needs to fight does not mean that you're always the person that needs to fight it. And some of us just have that. That's, that's my spirit in me is I, I start twitching when I see something's not right, man. I'm just like, Ugh. Oh, somebody, somebody gonna deal with that? You know, just miss, I'm the guy who'll walk into your house and he'll notice the pictures like this on the wall. And when you step out of the room, I'll run over there and I'll straighten that thing up and then pretend like I never did. I can't stand things to not be the way they're supposed to be. I think Josiah had some of that in him. And so when he felt violated, he felt disrespected, he felt um, that, that the king of Egypt and his army were presuming upon his goodness by cutting through the land without permission. Josiah just wanted to go to war. Now, the only reason I feel pretty confident in saying that, that he did not necessarily know whether or not it was the will of the Lord for him to go to the fight. How do I know that? Because when he did go to battle, he put on a costume. The Bible says he hid himself. That means he disguised himself. In other words, in a battle, in a war, when the, the king is seen on the battlefield, the opposing army knows if they can kill the king, they win the war. And so Josiah didn't want to be seen as a king. Let me tell you something. When you're walking and you know you're in the will of the Lord, you don't have to disguise yourself. You don't have to pretend to be something you're not. You don't have to put on a, a posturing of saying, you know. And, and so when Josiah went to the battle, there's a hint that he, he wasn't real sure if God was on his side or not. So he thought, okay, well, I'll just trick the enemy. And so when he goes out on the battlefield, he's fighting a fight that God didn't call him to. As a matter of fact, God sent word to tell him not to fight this fight. But the man who was born for war did not know how to say no to a fight that God had not called him to. Um, I, I feel like there's actually a little prophetic oil on this, if I can use that phrase. I, I'm, I'm sensing this, that in the room tonight, I don't have anybody in mind. I have no clue where this needs to land. Maybe it doesn't need to land anywhere, but I feel like I need to say it. There are some of you that are right now trying to figure out, do I need to fight this fight or not? All I'm saying, I'm not telling you yes or no, because I don't know who you are and I don't know what you're thinking about fighting, but I am going to tell you this. It's worth your while to slow down and find out if you've got permission from God. Because the wrath of man never works the righteousness of God. And our hastiness only leads to lack or want, according to the book of Proverbs. And so especially if you've got kind of like a bulldog nature in you and you don't mind growling and you don't mind biting and you don't mind fighting back, all Josiah had to do was seek the Lord. And the Lord would have told him, no, Josiah, I really did send that king to tell you not to. I mean, listen, Josiah's got an amazing track record with God. He's proven himself as a discerning believer. All he had to do was come before the Lord and say, is that of you or is that not of you? But there's no indication that he ever sought the Lord. So he got in the middle of a fight that God never called him to. So let's be wise about what we give our energies to. Um, you can't fight everything. There are some fights he'll call you to. But I'm going to tell you, if you spend your whole life looking for a fight, you're eventually going to find one that you're going to regret. And so let's be wise about this. So the last couple of verses, here comes an outcome that was not anyone's desire. The archers the guys with the bow and arrows in Egypt's army, shot him. They shot King Josiah. And the king said to his servants, take me away, 
for I'm badly wounded. So his servants took him out of the chariot that he was in, carried him in the second chariot, and brought him to Jerusalem, and he died. And he was buried in the tombs of his fathers. As a response, all of Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. Jeremiah, the primary prophet, uttered a lament. That means he gave a formal lamentation over the death of Josiah. And then they wrote songs about him. All the singing men and the singing women have spoken of Josiah and their laments to this day. So isn't it amazing, this beautiful life that we've walked through all these chapters, and it ends kind of like in a ah moment. The beauty of this is that Josiah was never judged by God for his final failure. In other words, the mistake, the regrettable decision, the hasty action, the moment of operating in the flesh did not negate all of the things that God had witnessed and empowered Josiah to do. The Bible says that on, in his death they honored him. But let me tell you what happened shortly after his death. His son took the throne and led the nation right back into the sin that Josiah spent his whole life delivering them from. That is a powerful testimony to the strength of human depravity. That his son who grew up, the son of the great reformer king, Josiah had by sheer power, zeal, and authority enacted a reformation of righteousness in the land. But when he, the leader of it, was taken out of the picture, the people went right back to the pig, pig, uh, pig pen. They went right back to their stuff. So, the lessons for us in his death are these. Ultimately, an outward reframing of conduct, behavioral modification, forcing people to change their behavior is not the same thing as lasting spiritual transformation. There are times where we're going to see as Christians that we want people to modify their behavior before they've ever met the transformer. We, we want them to stop doing this, start doing this, clean up their act. It reminds me of something that happened years ago, long before I was pastor of what was then Meadow. I was on staff, and we had won a lesbian to the Lord, and her life was beginning to be transformed. And as she came to church... After years of living in, in, a, in the homosexual community and culture, and the gospel had impacted her, some woman in the church took her aside and said, you're saved now. Quit dressing like a man. She was gone from our assembly because she learned in that moment what was important to the people in that church was the exterior and the outside, and they went for that. Why would anybody do that? I believe this, to make them feel better about her life. Because after all, if we wrap up our struggles in tradition and religion, well, doesn't that solve everything? And the answer is no, it didn't solve it for that woman, and it didn't solve it for ancient Israel. So what we're going for here, I told you you're going to get out early, so I repent of lying, but Two minutes, two minutes. What we're going for here in this mission base, New Bridge being the church of the IHOP Atlanta mission base, we're all one, we're all connected. It just means God has expanded our community, expanded our influence, expanded his plans that he has for us, so at least our, our understanding of those plans have been expanded. We're not going for superficial changing of people's exteriors. We are going for heaven-sent and heaven-sustained real revival. Where the Holy Spirit, yeah, that's worthy. Where the Holy Spirit is the one who does the heavy lifting in a person's heart. And we get to walk alongside of one another. And we get to, at times, challenge one another. At times, correct one another. But most of the time, celebrate with one another as we enter into a season of victory where all of the glory goes to God. 
We're not going to try to get people to conform outwardly to make us feel comfortable. We're going to go for their hearts 10 times out of 10. And we're not going to get impatient with the Holy Spirit as he works on people. We're going to wait for the Lord to do that work that, by the way, he's doing in you. He's making you more like Jesus. He's he's changing your heart. He's transforming your thinking. He's growing your soul and and stretching your spirit. And so you wouldn't want anybody to kind of push you along to try to make it happen artificially. And we're not going to do that to one another. Why? Because we don't have to. Because when revival hits, I'm going to tell you, there is an elevation of the power and the presence of God that will do more in a day and a season of revival than 10 years of tradition might try to produce in somebody's life. And so I want you to expect that. I want you to pray for that. And when it happens, when you start seeing it unfolding, don't get impatient with the process. He knows what he's doing. Don't try to wrap up something you're uncomfortable with in robes of religion so you don't have to look at it anymore. We're going to love people. We're going to walk with people. We're going to stick with people. We're going to help people. And we're going to watch what God does. And in the end, we're going to say, do you see what the Son of God is still doing on the earth today? All glory be to his holy name. Stand together.